Welcome back to Open Line. Talking about the opioid crisis in Tennessee. The governor has a plan, Tennessee Together, a comprehensive plan to address uh, what we're seeing across the state. Uh, and we have with us uh, a great panel tonight talking about that. Let's go to the phones because we have a bunch of calls. Let's start with uh, Reverend Fuzz. Hello, Reverend Fuzz. Oh, wow. Hey, Dan. Hi, what's on your mind? I, I got this question, um, the faith-based director. I say that my church became a partner and we set a three-year period that we're going to do something and learn something. Tell me some of the specific things that a congregation would be expected or needed to do, what kind of budget would we be setting aside, how much resources and volunteers, what would be a perfect partner of a church with 200 members? Uh, Pastor Fuzz, thank you. Um, thank you. And I'm a, a very big fan of your congregation. Um, a congregation like yourself, Pastor Fuzz, especially in the area you're located in, we just need someone to open the doors and to pass out information and possibly have a recovery support group. Uh, the only only budgetary concerns you'd have is whoever would be at the church as a volunteer, uh, and, and that would be it. We're, we're looking for spiritual and pastoral support from, from the hierarchy, which we know and the whole community knows they have from you. Uh, we're looking for people who will host or refer individuals to recovery support groups, and that doesn't necessarily define a recovery support group as a traditional 12-step. It could be a feeding ministry, a clothing ministry, or access to any other ministry. And also, partner with our Project Lifeline so when people come to your congregation and they need yeah. to get into treatment and they may not necessarily have resources, we have an individual that can help guide them and connect them with the resources to get them into that, uh, get them into one of those treatment programs. Does that help, Reverend Fuzz? What do you think? It helps a lot. Of, you know, we're very concerned about this, and we've had members deceased from this opioid, so I look forward to touching bases with this group and being a part of this. Yes, sir. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Lucy. Hello, Lucy. Hey, y'all. Hey, Hello. Lucy. Hey. I have a two-part two comment, and the first part of it is that there's other dimensions than what y'all have have just mentioned. You know, when these drugs started hitting the uh, pharmaceutical market back in the early 90s, uh, doctors were right prescriptions for them, right and left back then for anything. And if you, if you did not take the prescription, they wrote you down as non-compliant. Mm -hmm. The people, I have known so many people who did take the prescription, got hooked within a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. And yep. then when they cut them off, would end up in the ER, they would, or on workers' comp, it would end up in the ER, and if they tested positive for any substitute drug to where their opiate, uh, opiate addiction had come from the prescription, they would yank uh, IDs out of the ER, their arms, and, and drop them right there in the ER, wouldn't even treat them, because they said, you're using street drugs. They, they didn't even think that they were part of this problem, and at that time, uh, every major news station on their news magazines had been doing stories on, on these pills. Right, this was right. over 25 years ago. Now, here's my last part of my comment. Okay. As a taxpayer, I don't want one dime of my money spent on any opiate recovery program until you guys make sure that you quit allowing the United States of America to be the number one drug laundering country in the world. And it, it, drug, drug dealers have become the bank of people in an underground banking system. 60 Minutes did a story on this about shell companies. And until y'all do that, I don't want to dime of my money going to this. We, okay, we all right, Lucy. Okay, I'm going to move on. I mean, so there's passion here. Yeah. We have yes. somebody on Facebook saying doctors are legal drug dealers. They over prescribe mm -hmm. for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. That's Christy mm -hmm. Michelle Stevens. Mm -hmm. so a lot of passion with this. Mm -hmm. You heard Lucy saying people did what they were told. They right. took a whole bottle of this yeah. stuff and then all of a sudden right. they're addicted. Right. Mm -hmm. Lucy, I, I really appreciate you calling. I know we all do. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a family member that got addicted just the way you just went through. And here's what I'd say to you. We've got a great AG in this state, and they are considering right now what to do related to how to respond to the pharmaceutical companies. The doctors did what they thought was right, 
And then what happened is new research came out and people started getting addicted. Our Commissioner of Health, Dr. Dreisner, talks about that research around how many days it takes before you get addicted. So Lucy, what you're saying makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, we do need to help people right now in our state that are uninsured, that, that need help. But I totally appreciate what you've mm -hmm. said. Absolutely. How much pushback, I guess this would be for you, has do plans like this get from pharmaceutical companies? Mm -hmm. So we've talked about doctors. Doctors were doing what they were told. Um, it's what they were taught. It's what they were encouraged to do by pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies have sat back and made a lot of money mm -hmm. um, as these drugs have just skyrocketed in, in sales. Is there any pushback? What sort of um, discussion has there been with those companies? Yeah, I think, I think they have started to, uh, to the extent possible, own their part of, of this epidemic. I, I think we all would agree more needs to be done on that. But even we saw just recently one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies has slashed its sales force. So they said, we're going to take all these people who are going into these doctor's offices to sell our product mm -hmm. because we realize the market isn't there anymore and we need to mm -hmm. do our part. Um, again, I think we would all say more needs to be done, but yeah. as far as our plan, we've heard from, from different pharmaceutical companies that they're supportive of the idea of limiting the number of days of opioids for someone who is newly taking opioid medication. Uh, let's go to David. Hello, David. Yes. What's on your mind? Uh, there was a major backlash for patient care in hospitals now because I was recently admitted to the hospital and I had to threaten to get up and leave to get a pain shot for a bowel obstruction. And I wonder how many people would stand their ground and really uh, say, I'm going to leave unless you do something for my pain. And, you know, how many people are going to end up suffering needlessly in the hospital now because of these people that can't control how many meds they take. And that's really going to cause a lot of people to suffer in the hospital now like I did. I mean, I had to tell the nurse that I was honestly going to leave mm -hmm. unless she gave me something for my pain. And she said, well, what are you going to I said, I'm not going to lay here and suffer needlessly. All right, well, let's talk mm -hmm. about that. On Facebook, mm -hmm. we are seeing a lot of people who are saying, I suffer from chronic, chronic pain, pain. Yeah. and I yeah. worry yeah. about any sort of change yeah. that's going to make it harder for me to deal with my condition. Yeah. So and that's what I think we're here and there. Yeah, and w you have to be careful, as David mentioned, that you swing the pendulum too far to the other side. And our goal is not to have our population who is in pain not be able to access the medication that they need. Um, so with that said, the governor's plan around um, limiting the number of days for an initial opioid prescription um, explicitly exempts chronic pain patients, cancer patients, folks in palliative care, hospice care. There's kind of a whole host of people that we know um, need access to these medications, and the goal is not to limit it for them, but to really kind of funnel the number of folks we're seeing moving from an opioid naive patient, someone who hasn't had an opioid, into the chronic category. What we want to do is put more, um, what we say are kind of speed bumps along the way before they're a chronic user. And one of the areas that's most heartbreaking is uh, they were seeing babies born, yeah. uh, their mothers yeah, that yeah. are addicted, and, mm -hmm. and their babies that are born. Mm -hmm. What is being done about that? It, it looks like there's some things in here that are, are specifically meant to address that. Absolutely. When you look at that treatment piece, one of the things that's really great is that that funding will actually go to work with pregnant mothers mm -hmm. uh, that are trying to detox and, and not stay in that life of addiction. Monty, you might want to tell a couple a story about your work with pregnant women and what you've been doing related to that? Well, when we're working with our faith community to embrace the pregnant women, to give them educational resources and sometimes even financial resources. Uh, we're, we're, we're operating around Tennessee in, in rural areas as well as our metropolitan areas. And so when we get out in our rural areas, there's a lack of resources, uh, mm -hmm. lack of access to treatment, lack of access to recovery support services. Mm -hmm. Our Project Lifeline is connecting um, the, 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 the ladies that are in those communities with resources that can help them get better resources from outside of their mm -hmm. community. And one of, uh, an example is uh, our Project Lifeline operates from Memphis to Mountain City. Sometimes an individual will ask for help in the eastern part of Tennessee and they need to get out of eastern Tennessee. They will access, they will reach out to someone in Western Tennessee, meet them halfway, get the person out of their backyard, out of their playground, away from their playmates. And that's how we 
initiate the process to get into treatment and then to get into recovery support. So taking it from a multifaceted approach like that, we're, we're, we're able to catch more people in a much wider net. How effective, Commissioner, is treatment? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, how long, do, do we know this yet? How long should a person stay in on average? What are the rates of, of, of cure or whatever the case mm -hmm. may be of a successful mm -hmm. outcome and how many go back into addiction? Thanks so much for asking that. Uh, we talked about that a lot at the department. Uh, treatment's more effective than, than death. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing happening in our state are three people a day are dying because they're addicted to a substance and we're clamping down on that. People are now using pills, street pills. You know, if you're going to use a street pill, please don't. Go to your ED um, because they're laced with fentanyl and that's a lot of what's going on right now with the death with the death uh, toll. But as far as how effective is treatment, uh, here's what we know. If you get somebody into detox and they get through that physical piece of the withdrawal and you help them and then you hook them up with whether it's residential or whether it's wraparound case management or whether it's 12 step or whether it's faith based, you wrap that all around. The longer a person stays in recovery where they don't relapse, the better odds they've got. So for example, with a one year recovery stint, you've got really good odds of staying in recovery. One of the best programs is one that's used with doctors and uh, airplane pilots, and we know that they stay in a recovery probably 85%, I believe, and uh, that's based on five years of being in recovery, and there's a lot of wraparound with them. And so one thing we're grateful for is these dollars will allow us to, to do more uh, recovery wraparound to keep people in our state in treatment. It's more effective than death. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And how much of this is federal money and how much of this is state money? It's a combination. Right? It is a combination. Mm -hmm. So we got about, I believe, 13.8 13 13 point point million point eight from mm -hmm. um, the Federal Cures Act. Um, we got that last year as well as a second allotment of that. And then this year the governor put in about 15 million in new dollars towards um, prevention, treatment, and law enforcement, the majority of which is towards treatment which is on top of the, the six million that um, mm -hmm. was put in last year specifically for treatment. Well, let's go to Rebecca. Hello, Rebecca. Hi. Go right ahead. Hi, this is Rebecca. Um, I've just heard some of the things that have been stated, and yes, I understand there is a horrible, horrible addiction to an opiate, but placing everyone, like you said earlier, that into that one category is difficult. Putting a policy across the straits the board is hard. Um, there is so many state restrictions that someone that is in chronic pain, if you go to your doctor, you get a prescription and you go to physical therapy, you do every, uh, 10 units, you do um, occupational therapy, you do uh, water therapy, you do everything you can do and you're still on your opiates because A, you have a, so more, say comorbidities that you cannot have surgery or some other reason, um, then it places it difficult. It places people like me in a hard place where I have to jump through, as you say, 19 steep bumps, 14 barrels just to get a medication because we've got so many thousands of people that are addicted. Mm -hmm. But I do, I go by the rules. But yeah, okay, I'm right, placed let's, in let's, that category. I go right, to one more than one call mm -hmm. and I'm telling you on Facebook mm -hmm. more than one comment yeah. saying that and you addressed it but let's just hammer home the point for the people out there that clearly are concerned mm -hmm. one more time the governor's bill does not say you cannot get an opioid Correct. it does not say that right it limits it Jane. so the specific proposal says if you have not had an opioid in the last 30 days from the day you go into the doctor's office if you've not had an opioid for the last 30 days you can get up to 10 days of opioids at 40 morphine milligram equivalent um, dosage a day now what we know, and I, I, I want to just base this in information we didn't have a year ago, which is that the CDC says the likelihood of being on opioids after five days of being on opioids, the likelihood on that sixth day 
jumps higher than we ever knew before in terms of your long-term um, predictability of being on opioids a year later. Wow. And so based on this research, you see this mm -hmm. trend happening both other states and nationally to say, we've got to address the fact that we know these, these um, these drugs are causing people to become addicted. Right. Um, now, if after 10 days you still need um, you still need pain care, you return to your doctor, have a conversation with your doctor to say, "I'm still in pain." What we want to have happen, based on the governor's proposal, is a conversation between you and your doctor to say, "Is something else going on here?" We can put you on 30 days of opioids. That's part of what the proposal is, and at 40 mme a day. But before we do that, one, let's have you sign an informed consent form saying that you understand the dangers to you mm -hmm. as well as um, if you're of childbearing age to a potential child um, as well as let's talk about alternatives to opioids before we just put you on 30 days of opioids so again mm -hmm. it's it's a specific population of individuals who's not who have not been treated for 30 days um, would would have to have a limit I would not say it's 19 um, speed bumps I would say it's probably two uh, which which seems reasonable in light of our epidemic. There is no doubt huge numbers of people are getting addicted. Yes. Mm -hmm. Something has happened over the last several years that has allowed huge numbers to get mm -hmm. addicted. Mm -hmm. And it, it's fascinating if there is that research out there that it, it mm -hmm. maybe occurs after that fifth, sixth day for mm -hmm. a lot of people. And maybe, you know, there are plenty of people where that's not the case, right. mm -hmm. but for a lot of people that's the case. Okay, we have to take a break. Um, and I want to thank two of our guests for being here. Thank you mm -hmm. both. Commissioner uh, Williams, Monty Burks, thank you mm -hmm. for being here. Mm -hmm. We are now going to bring up uh, Tony Parker, Department of Correction, Michael Jones, TBI. Take a break. Be back right after this.